Good evening. I'm Gwyn Philbrook of the New York Times. Welcome to the first night of the 11th annual Arts and Leisure Weekend. Our next guest tonight is an Emmy Award winner and a Grammy Award nominee whose performances on stage and screen are exceptionally inventive, incredibly hilarious, and always surprising. He joins us on the eve of the premiere of the final six episodes of The Increasingly Poor Decisions of Todd Margaret, which he created, co-wrote, produced, and stars in, and which will air on IFC this weekend. He is also, of course, known for various film and TV roles, including the unforgettable Tobias Funke on Arrested Development, <laughs> as well as his stand-up comedy and his best-selling book, which he will be signing downstairs after the discussion. Our moderator is a reporter on the Culture Desk of the Times, and he is the lead contributor to the must-read Arts Beat column and blog. He is also the author of the unsparingly honest memoir, Cocaine's Son, and is currently working on a new book about the Oscar-winning landmark film, Network. Please join me in welcoming Dave Itzkoff and our very special guest, David Cross. The New York Times is a tool of the left-leaning liberal Jew I'm, I'm very proud to be one of those Jews sitting across from you tonight. Le <laughs> left leaning? Uh, le le you say, uh, left leaning? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to check my pants. Uh, yeah, left. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it really is an honor and a thrill to be sitting across from you tonight. And we're going to do everything we can to get you home so you can watch the first episode of Work It on Again, your, on yes, your thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Work it. Yeah. We, were, we were talking about that earlier. Uh, let's not dwell on it. But as any, I, I, I went on Facebook and I urged people to watch it, uh, not because it's a great show, but because it's a, 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 a curious show that can only get uh, worse slash better. Uh, <laughs> as I'm just hoping it, it can go like a third season. So I'm just dying to know what episode 53 is going to be. <laughs> it's awful. It's awful wonderful. It's all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're not promoting shows that you love slash hate, you know, you have this really expansive resume of now not only your stand-up career, your sketch comedy writing and performance, your work on, you know, shows that you've created yourself, like Todd Margaret, which we'll be talking about, your work in other people's films and TV shows. I mean, is, is there any of those things that you most closely identify with that is the most you, or are they all extensions of the same impulse? It's probably my work with charity uh, <laughs> that I mo really identify with. Uh, every time I see a, a, a blind or a deaf, I just. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I suppose uh, stand up is the most uh, uh, the thing I identify with because it's it's uh, a monologue. It's my voice. It's uh, it's observations and thoughts, and I don't have to um, uh, take ideas and and put them through uh, characters, world, or voice, or, or invent that world. And um, and some of that stuff can can be a little abstract. So I suppose the 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 closest thing, just by virtue of where it's coming from, is stand-up. Um, and you get to swear a lot more right. in it. And uh, um, that's important to me, uh, <laughs> because I have a swear jar at home. And, uh, and I'm, I'm like about a couple hundred feet away from a boat, so, uh, which I'll give to charity. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I saw you perform at the opening of the new uh, Upright Citizens Brigade Club mm. uh, in the East Village, and it was, I mean, you were literally just reading blog comments, and it was so funny just to see you do that. I mean, what, the, where does your comedic voice come from? Were there experiences that you think specifically created it, or was it just getting out there and doing it a lot? Well, um, I mean, outside of... Uh, uh, Real anecdotal things and stories that I that I tell on stage, uh, which which is is more of a recent uh, development in my in my standup, uh, going back, whatever it's been twenty some odd years, whatever more than that. Um, but anyway, uh, 
I, I suppose in the abstract sense, the, uh, the fact that I moved around constantly as a kid, uh, I was never in one place for more than a year uh, until I moved to, uh, until I was, I don't know, 13 in Georgia. And, uh, and even though, like I moved from apartment complex, we got evicted a couple times and moved around and, um, and then kind of settled as it, as it were in closer into the city uh, in Atlanta when, um, when I was 15. And, and, I, and, and I suppose that had a lot to do with it. And also going uh, various places from, from the north to the south, it's to the west, to the north again, to the south, and different places in the south. And, um, uh, and then adding to that the fact that I was a Jew, um, a dirty, Dirty Jew, <laughs> and then adding to that that I was dirt poor, which uh, was, it's like, it's like an alien, like the idea of a of a poor Jew to to people in the the rural South, ignorant South, Baptist, <laughs> in the '70s was just what that doesn't compute. I thought you were all rich. Like, what's wrong with you? What did right. they kick you out, or did they take your money? I don't understand. And. Um, uh, I think that had a lot to do with what uh, what I'm like now, I suppose. Right. I, I, I know you're from Georgia. Is it too late to offer you my condolences about REM? Has that window closed? Um, look, they, they, uh, I lost a lot of money with that, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> um, I, Dave and I made a bet uh, 30 years ago uh, that REM would last for 29 years, and it lasted 28 years. Uh, this is two years before they got together, so you know, it was <laughs> roll of the dice, really. Um, uh, uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. OK. <laughs> Not a sincere question. Of, yeah. yeah, I didn't mean to throw you. <laughs> As an interviewer, the, your questions should not be rhetorical. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they should probably draw you out a little more, right? <laughs> there should be give and take. <laughs> when, when you look back. Oh, this is a rhetorical question. Right. When you were a kid. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you look back, especially at the 1990s and the era when you, you know, were first you know, coming to people's attention, I mean, does it just seem silly that there was this thing, this sort of artificial category called alternative comedy? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it was, it, it kind of, uh, I'm thinking this for the first time now. I, I think there was a, because it's, it's an easy, it's, it's easy and it's a bit lazy, but it also, uh, it did really mean a real thing. It was, it, in the sense that any comedy that was uh, not, what was the, the, the ubiquitous, uh, Roll up the jacket, observational kind of Seinfeldian uh, uh, kind of stuff. Not not knocking him at all, but that was a lot of the type right. of comedy. So anything outside of that was was alternative, just by the nature of the, the definition of the word. Um, uh, An alternative later kind of became uh, hipster and yeah. grungy and, and indie. Um, but it, it is an applicable term if you were to. But you, I think we all bristled at it because it was in our nature. Um, to as a, as a as individuals and as a group to go, hey man, the man's calling us uh, whatever alternative. <laughs> that's bullshit, you know. And, <laughs> but as I as I get older, it's like, well, you had to call it something because it was different. You don't want to go on a long-winded uh, definition of or description of it. So yeah, f it alternative. Right. I mean, it was you partly know. coming from right a sense that it, you know it was the mainstream or the establishment, but it was on its way out in some way. Yes, and, and it uh, uh, conflated with, not conflated, uh, uh, what's the word, when it, it uh, simultaneously uh, uh, happened with uh, uh, music doing yeah. the same thing. So, and, and there was alternative music. So it was just, uh, um, it's kind of an easy label. And there are different people, very different styles within that world, but you know, to be honest, now at 47, yeah, it's alternative. Right. It's fine. <laughs> Did you have a sense that, I mean, you and the people that you were performing with, coming up with, were going to be 
you know, that, that you were going to really kind of stick around and be the voices and the people who, you, you know, set the, t the tone for the next 20 years plus of comedy? <laughs> no, well, when you say it like that, no. Uh, <laughs> not at all. That would be, <laughs> what a pretentious little <laughs> shit I would have been. <laughs> Imagine us at a bar, like, we're going to set the tone for, uh, <laughs> I'll say North American comedy, not Mexico, but Canada and that part of <laughs> roughly 20 years. Mm. No, uh, there, were, there was a, there was a uh, definite awareness, uh, understanding, and, and energy that came from us knowing that, that it was, uh, they were special times. In, in, and, uh, and when I think back on some of the shows, we just dicked around. I mean, we were, we were around and entertaining ourselves and putting these shows on basically for ourselves and our friends and uh, we happened to be doing it at the at the literal epicenter of you know where entertainment comes from and uh, so we we and and we were also working with people who at least for myself and everybody you know at, at each wave uh, was working with somebody who was established like Janine Garofalo when we were doing stuff in LA she was already popular, and she was always uh, she was already the poster girl for that kind of comedy, and um, and uh, you know various other people who who were already on TV, and and then Bob Odenkirk and I getting on TV and doing our thing, and then bringing those other people in, and those people getting on TV and bringing other people in. So when we were all doing it, it was uh, we we knew it was uh, special and great, and. Uh, um, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think there were many of us who were going. To, who were all sitting around, positive we were going to be famous, right? And do that thing that you ever, whatever you said, right. the thing. That you did. <laughs> Change the face of comedy for all right. eternity. Oh, I, can that, never go back old, again. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, one of your first major credits, maybe the first major credit, was was writing on the Ben Stiller show. It was, did, yeah, the first, yeah. Right. Did that feel like, a, as you were saying before, the kind of place where you could experiment and try out new things, or were you just sort of always feeling like this could just end at any minute? Well, it did end at yeah. any minute. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was an exact minute. Right. Uh, 7.59 yeah. on a Sunday night. Uh, <laughs> that, um, that show was, was different. I mean, uh, Ben and Judd uh, quite literally gave me my start. And uh, um, I, I was a mid-season writer replacement that came out from Boston. Um, and that was really at, at Janine's behest. Janine had a lot to do with that. Um, and uh, but that was a strange situation that I, I wasn't uh, entirely comfortable with. Um, was writing was writing for somebody else. I had a, a sketch group in Boston I'd been working with for like three years. Excuse me, I'm just about to burp. Go for it. It's gone. It's okay. gone. Um, <laughs> but uh, God, it's right here. I know it's going to come around later. <laughs> and I and it was a hot dog. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I was going to say pastrami, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it was uh, a, a strange. It, it, it was new to me to write for somebody who, whose strength uh, and whose desire was to do parodies and and uh, and you know write a Tom Cruise bit and write a Bruce Springsteen bit and that wasn't really my forte. The the one thing that I got in, I, I wrote dribs and drabs on other things and did a little kind of punch ups and offered some stuff and did a couple, couple of other uh, kind of uh, uh, sketches on that show that weren't really my ideas. But um, the one idea that I think if you look at it, it sort of foreshadows nicely the stuff we did on Mr. Show and stuff I did later, which was uh, the uh, sketch called The Legend of T.J. O'Pooter Toots. And, yeah. uh, that was the one. That was one. That was my idea, uh -huh. and, that, and that was. But that was really the only one, you know. Right. So it was. It was a little odd, right. and uh, not, not something I thought. This is the greatest thing ever. Right. You know? That was the sort of family restaurant with the kind of Donner Party type legacy. Yeah. Yeah. It was like Soylent Green. Right. Like they were. Yeah. Serving people, and right. that's what the pooter balls were. Right. <laughs> Of, of all the people on, on that writing staff, which you know included Judd Apatow, people like you know Brent Forrester and Dino Stamatopoulos, why do you think you know you and Bob Odenkirk uh, had, did you 
kind of find each other in that group? Or we, we, Bob was a dick to me. Bob was, uh, and, and he, he knows this. He, he, it's not like uh, I'm, I'm revealing this for the first time, but uh, he, he gave me shit. And I will say, I probably, uh, I would imagine, uh, much like Bob, came in with my own attitude. And my attitude was uh, uh, really a, a bit pretentious, and, uh, and it was a little comedy elitist, the idea that I'm going to Hollywood. You know, and I remember, <laughs> it's so embarrassing, but I remember I was at a loft party and uh, um, there was, you know, it was like three in the morning and I'm up and it's, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, illegal party where they have kegs on uh, the freight elevators and they send them down. They got guys with walkie talkies going, this is in, in uh, South Boston. And, you know, it's like a big warehouse loft party. and. Um, Morphine was playing. I mean, just to give you some real indie cred here. <laughs> and, uh, and I was going out to LA um, uh, the next day, and it was very quick. I got a call. You got to do this. You got to come in three to whatever. And I remember sitting there with my friend Mark Rivers, who wrote the theme song for Mr. Show, brought out to LA. And I remember just going, <laughs> sitting there with a drink, like, oh man, <sighs> everything's going to change, man. <laughs> Everything's gonna change. You know, like, <laughs> ugh, ugh, awful, <laughs> awful. Like, you know, if you saw it in Garden State, you might go, oh, God. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was, I look back on it, it was, it was quite pretentious. But I, I had that attitude. So I came in there with a, uh, like a comedy purity thing. And, um, uh, cause what I was, you know, whatever. And, um, and, I, and I quickly got my ass kicked on that, as I, as I should have. And, um, and there were a couple of people I befriended, but Bob was, uh, he was, he, he liked to with me, you know? And, uh, and I really, I was a bit overwhelmed, I was intimidated, and um, we were not friendly. Uh, and then there's like kind of a, a well-known story of Janine taking me to his house to play basketball, and him not even get, he was just in his, chair, and so like, this is my friend David, this is the first time we met, and he's in his chair watching TV, and he's got a sandwich, and he's like, he wanted to play basketball, I knew you'd play basketball, you wanna, he's like, nah, I didn't come up, didn't come say hi, that was my very first meeting right. with him, nah, <laughs> okay, all right, um, so. And from these auspicious beginnings. Yeah, but we ended up, uh, I remember the, the, the moment, I remember it vividly, we were in uh, friend Laura Milligan's kitchen during a party, and we started riffing what became the uh, the sketch on Mr. Show? The the pan the the um, he, he played the English uh, guy, and I was the crazy. Hey, oh. uh, these pans are great. Whatever. I, I don't. I haven't seen the show in, <laughs> right. in fifteen years. I don't well, know. get ready because we've got. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the kiss the pan thing. The pan kisses you. Uh, it was that sketch that we started riffing, uh, and that was the first time we really like connected, and then. Uh, we did sketches in each other's sketch show, which we all, uh, the, the alternative pack, uh, used to perform at this, uh, in the back of this disco on Hollywood Boulevard. Um, and uh, the sketches we wrote together, effortless. I've never had that. I've written with a lot of great people and written some good stuff with, you know, really good people. But with Bob and I, it was, it was crazy. We'd never experienced that. Just effortless. Just Fi finishing each other's stuff and uh, and taking it different places and uh, um, and that's yeah. Right. You seemed to have the, at least the voice of the show figured out, you know, really very quickly in terms of you know skits that were operating on multiple levels within a segment. You were switching between you know film and video, and that meant different things. You were stepping out of character, addressing folks directly. That that was something that um, both Bob and I we're doing in our individual shows before we came, got together. He, he uh, I had this show in, in uh, Boston, uh, as I said, that that's, w would start off at a, uh, a real comedy club where it was a real comedy night. It was like Tuesday night, open mic night or whatever. And, um, and initially before people figured it out, we had a good year where we could, uh, you know, I would host, uh, or someone would host, we'd have a plant in the audience, we'd have four real comics go on, and then we'd have a fake comic, somebody doing a character, whether it was me or somebody else. Then that would devolve, and then we'd be on stage, and we'd leave the stage, there was a back door behind, uh, to the back of us, and then it would shoot to film, you know, that was in the, uh, starting from walking into 
backstage what we'd shoot earlier in the day. And, and so, and, and I saw Bob um, doing his one-man show that he had done in Chicago at the Upfront Theater in um, Santa Monica, and he had similar elements. And I was like, holy shit. And, this, and we weren't really friends yet. Mm. And I saw it, cause, and I was like, wow, he'd really like my stuff, I think. It's very similar. And, and we talked about that. And uh, so it, it, there are elements from Mr. Show that w we were both kind of experimenting with on our own. Uh, and so, as I said, it was effortless. And we just, all these cool ideas, and, right. you know. I mean, it, the show, you know, I mean, was always kind of moving around HBO's schedule and, and you know, different, different nights of the week and never totally clear when you know, new seasons were going to start. I mean, yep. I, I'm sure you're thrilled to be reminded of let, this. Let me tell you a quick, uh, yeah. little quick anecdote. I went to uh, the uh, George Carlin live show at the Beacon Theater years and years and years ago. Um, and uh, I was there with, you know, HBO invited me. And I, I went there, and uh, a guy uh, to my right is all, all these HBO people, and he's like, Hey, uh, my name's, uh, I can't remember his name, you know, my, gay, my name's Gary Humphreys. <laughs> I'm the guy who ruined your life. <laughs> and, uh, and he says it with kind of half smile, like, gee shucks. I'm like, I'm in the middle of shaking his hand. Huh? I'm the guy who scheduled you at uh, uh, Monday at midnight. And the reason we don't have a show on anymore, and he's saying it with this kind of like, yeah, yeah, you win some, you lose some. <laughs> Not me, I mean you, you lose some. Um, and I, I was, I, I was thinking, like, I, and we were on the balcony, and I was like, wow, you're so lucky I'm, I'm here and not Bob, because he would have punched you and thrown you over that balcony, you piece of shit. And well, that's a funny little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel, you know, I mean, it's your relationship to the series, I mean, inevitably, it's different from how uh, the home viewer experienced it because we, I think we all have, you know, our attachments to favorite skits. It's Not necessarily. I've done so many drugs and I've been drinking nonstop, uh, Everclear, nonstop, <laughs> that it's always fresh and new. I don't, I don't remember half that stuff. I mean, I actually do remember it as I see it, but literally just seconds before it unfolds. So, right. uh, I, and I have not watched anything since we did commentary for it. So, wow. um, and I hope on my deathbed, I hope, oh, what is my deathbed gonna be like? Cause it'll be in the future. You think there'll be like cool mattresses, like, like super, it's gonna be so comfy and you just think about the bed and it hovers. Anyway, um, I hope on my, uh, that I'm able to watch them all and go, what a wonderful show. <laughs> Those two boys were very, very clever, you know, um, and see it fresh. All right. In, in, you know, in the years following and just, you know, I mean, as you're doing other projects, I mean, was it, was it hard to maybe get other people to see past that legacy or to accept, you know, you're separate from Bob, I, you know, I'm doing my own things now, he's doing his own things now? Not, not, not necessarily, because I, uh, once uh, Mr. Show was over and once uh, we finished the Ronnie Dobbs movie, um, I moved to New York. And I, I had been, I had always said, I moved to LA to make enough money to move away from LA. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of what I did, or at least get a, get a foothold of a career going so that I could, I could move to New York, which I had always wanted to move to. And, uh, um, and I finally did that in uh, 2000. And one, and uh, um, uh, and I, I immediately sort of separated from that and started doing stand up, doing a lot of stand up, and not really uh, um, with not much of a, a focus or a goal, um, but just starting to do lots of stand up, really enjoying it, touring, going out on the road with bands and and playing music clubs, and did that for for a while, and then that and, and then that really kind of uh, then Sub Pop came calling, and, and that so that it uh, kept me doing that for quite a while, and it, it allowed me to create my own uh, uh, an identity separate from Mr. Show. I right, suppose. right. So I mean, when you say, I mean, you're talking specifically about Shut Up, You Baby, and and those re and doing that record, that that sort of yeah, helped. that that was a result of I was actually um, uh, in a van with the band I was touring with uh, on my way back from Savannah, Georgia, going to Atlanta to play the last 
show that we had scheduled this kind of little mini tour up the up the down the East Coast, and it was great. We were having, it was a blast, and uh, and it wasn't my idea. It was it was uh, this guy from Sub Pop introduced himself, called me, and said, "Would you be interested in doing a comedy album?" No idea that I was on tour. I was like, I'm, I'm getting off tour right now. This is crazy. Uh, so we very quickly scheduled the next tour, which became Shut Up, you Baby, and, and, the, and the subsequent DVD. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's where that came from. But I was, I, I can be shockingly, for somebody who can be driven and, and work very, very hard, I can be shockingly irresponsible and Mr. Show, getting Mr. Show from a sketch show to showing it to HBO, not my idea. Never even thought of it. Didn't occur to me. Um, the idea of, of taking the stand-up that I was doing it and recording it, right. you know, <laughs> like the simplest rudimentary <laughs> thing that people have been doing for years, never occurred to me. It was just like, yeah, let's get in the band, drink all night, you know, do shows. Yeah, let's do this for a year. And it just didn't, it took somebody to go, Why, would you put out an album? Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Right, so right. It, it's become, you know, really challenging for a lot of comedians, I think, to, to make a living from, you know, recordings of, of their work. And was it? I mean, was the business in, in good shape even then, or were you just able to do it differently from other people? Um, well, I wouldn't say that I I made a living from that. I, I there have been. Throughout uh, uh, my career, the, if certainly with Mr. Show ending, there have been a number of movies I did, um, all kids movies, right. that paid me quite well. Right. Uh, at least for a guy who was used to not having a lot of money, to get a check for $50,000, yeah. uh, and then to go and get a check for $250,000, is like, I don't even know how to spend this, you know? And, uh, um, and I had, a couple of those scat. There was uh, uh, Small Soldiers, and then uh, Scary Movie Two, and uh, um, you consider that a kids movie? <laughs> <laughs> it's for the kid and all of us. Um, no, that one is not a kids. It's just if you have the um, yeah, sense of humor and the, the <laughs> mental capacity of a child, you will <laughs> enjoy that movie. It, it's it's interesting. Uh, is a, I'm digressing here, but. Uh, uh -huh. uh, when people ask me, um, so what are you most known for? Uh, and I will, it's all about your ethnicity. Like if you are Dominican, Puerto Rican, Haitian, black, it's Scary Movie 2. Right. And that's it. That is it. <laughs> scary Movie 2 may be Men in Black. Yo, you're the actor in Men in Black. And um, so sometimes I get that. If you're 10 and under, it's obviously Alvin and the Chipmunks. Uh, uh, if you have uh, one of these type of mustaches and you make artisanal cardboard boxes, <laughs> then it's Mr. Show. Uh, <laughs> it's, and please, somebody open up an artisanal cardboard box store <laughs> in, the, in Greenpoint, I guess, maybe? Bushwick? Hmm? Hmm. What? And, the, and what? Yes, yes, right. Um, he did those as well, yeah. Yeah, so that guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, right. You know, I mean, there, there are, you know, one time, two time, three time appearances that you made on other shows that some of us hold just as dearly as, you know, the material that you wrote yourself and, uh, you know, invested yourself in for years. I mean, can you, can you get similarly, similarly invested in, you know, a one-off, you know, news radio appearance or a couple no. episodes of Just Shoot Me? No. I mean, I, I do my best and I try to, uh, you know, I try to have fun and do, do whatever I can do, but um, I, 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 I don't watch those shows when they come on, not for any reason, not, not for like, oh, I can't stand watching myself, or, or I just don't. I don't watch a whole lot of TV anyway, and uh, um, uh, I don't have the, as you were uh, saying before, I don't have the same relationship with it. And, uh, and I've watched stuff, I finally saw, I mean, going back years now, but I finally saw the, the chicken pot pie, just shoot me thing. I saw some, there's another thing that I did in Mr. Show that people would, uh, all types of people were like, oh my God, that was so funny, which was this dance thing in uh, 
uh, Jeep, uh, Jeepers, Jeepers Creepers. Creepers. Yeah. And I've seen both of those, and I'm like, I, I don't get it. It's not, <laughs> it's not that funny. The chicken pot pie thing blows my mind. I mean, for years, years and years and years. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, for years, years and years. Yeah. Any like, coffee place, an airport, a bookstore, you know, in line at security at the, at the airport, whatever. Just Somebody. like, hey, it's chicken pot pie guy. Well, I love that. It's my wife's favorite thing. We quote it to each other. Like, oh, it's a phenomenon that's, yeah. that was all a, over the country. And it, I finally saw it. I'm like, what? There's nothing. I don't it get seemed, it. It though, I mean, did it just seem like it was well written for your voice? Or you were the guy that was available? Uh, no, I kind of riffed, I riffed that thing. Yeah. I riffed the, uh, the singy song part of it. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think I probably, uh, I, and I, not to be rude, but I, I probably ripped it because I was, I just, the original thing was like, this is so not funny. I don't, it's just dumb. I don't know. Um, and I probably just did it out of, uh, I riff a lot on all yeah, those things and yeah. they keep what they keep. And, right. You know. I mean, not to get too far ahead, but I mean, it, it, even in, in the slow Donny character, there's sort of, I mean, there's a germ maybe of the Todd Margaret character in the sense that this is, this is a guy who's told a tremendous lie. How dare you? I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> No, I mean only in the sense of, uh, um, oh, no kidding. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I pooed a mic pack. Um, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, it, 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 I mean, I get, I mean, it's a guy who's manipulating, well, yeah, whatever. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Anyhow. Did, it, so, I mean, with, with all that in mind, I mean, given that, you know, I mean, these kinds of things come up and, you know, it's not work that you wrote yourself. You can't necessarily get the same, you know, level of enthusiasm. I mean, how does something then like, you know, Arrested Development come on your radar? How do you know that that's, that's the right thing, that that's for oh, you? Oh, man, that, that was, I had just, uh, well, not just, at that point it had been, uh, I think we shot the pilot at the end of 2003, 2004. Yeah, it must have been 2003, 2004. I basically just moved to New York, been there for about two years, whatever, three years. Um, and having so much fun, it was so good for my mental health uh, to, to move to New York. And, um, and, and I did not, uh, they asked me to look at the script. I wasn't interested. I'm not going to go back to LA. I don't want to do a sitcom. I'd never met Mitch. Uh, then people, Bob's wife, Naomi, actually, uh, and my manager were like, please just look at it. It's really good. And they offered me basically whatever role, like just take it. And uh, and I read it, and it was really funny. But the 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 one that I immediately got, because they asked me to look at Job, which I thank God I didn't do that, and they got Will. <laughs> um, I didn't get. I didn't understand. It just didn't. Could have nipped his whole career in the butt. You could have <laughs> prevented. It was. Uh, I would have gotten him cheaper for Tom yeah. Margaret. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I see where you're going with this. Uh, just like a Jew. All right. Um, uh, no higher comp. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I, I didn't. I just didn't click. But uh, uh, Tobias, absolutely. I immediately got. I knew what he looked like. I knew how what he was and all that stuff. And it also was attractive to me to try to be a. Uh, reoccurring role, and uh, to only do like half the episodes, and and uh, I got out there. We shot the pilot, and I think I was literally doing the first episode of the the first season. And I called my girlfriend, and that was another thing. I was in the middle of this new good relationship, and and I called her and I said, I I know this isn't what you you know got in for, but um, I have this show is really special. It's really good, and I'm gonna have to stay and do it and be a, a regular. Uh, it's I, I don't want to be in LA. I know it sucks, but it's that good. And this is like the second episode. It wow. was so. I mean, we knew, we knew it was really pretty special. I, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to go to the set of, of Running Wild in the brief time that that was being made, and I got you know I saw the scripts that you know Mitch Hurwitz was was yeah. giving to people, and you know. It, the, you know, the asterisk was the sign that, you know, something had just been rewritten and that yes. it had had, and it was just like star, 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 all the it's, way down. It's the crazy. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, obviously the, the end result is great. Yeah. But man, Mitch, uh, his poor writers, his poor, <laughs> poor writers. <laughs> Wow. Do, do you, I mean, do you allow yourself to have favorite Tobias moments? Um, legally, I'm not allowed to. Right. Um, <laughs> 
but I can I get around that uh, when I'm traveling internationally and I'm in uh, either in international waters or uh, in a different time zone. I'm allowed to have favorite moments, um, and uh, and I will. I mean, I'll write down the moment, right. and then but as we're landing, eat it, and you know, make sure. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes, I, um, I, man, that whole, the whole experience uh, was just, I, I, towards the very end, I was getting frustrated, actually. Uh, it was the only negative uh, time, and it was, it was tough for a lot of us because we didn't know if, if we were going to be canceled yeah. or, or what was happening. Um, and, uh, and, and we were, at the very end, we were literally getting... Uh, like a 25 page script that was the first half of the show that we were going to shoot out of sequence uh, and we'd get it at the front door at like 5.45 a.m., 6 a.m. and you know, you get up and, and go to work. You'd have to be on set at like 6.30 or whatever and you're looking at the script. You're getting it the day you're shooting it and you're only getting half the script and it's gonna change right. and you don't know what's gonna make it in and it was, it's my, the only, negative thing I have to say about it. And, uh, and it was frustrating and tough. And then you, you would shoot a bunch, and, and this was true for everybody, and um, you know stuff would get rewritten, and you'd shoot half a day on a scene, and it's gone. And that would be frustrating. Right. But that was only at the very, very, very end. Right. You know? Did it, but was there also a kind of, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a camaraderie in the sense that, I mean, you, know, you were working really hard, there was at least the feeling that there were people that loved the hell out of that show. Ab oh, absolutely. We, I mean, that was, uh, that was a really, really great set to be on. Mm -hmm. Cast, crew, uh, I mean, we were all kind of in it together. And, uh, and Jason was, I learned a lot from working with Jason. He was such a, uh, a pro in every sense of the word. And um, he, when he was, he was, uh, I, I believe he won the Golden Globe. Uh, uh, one year, and he got up there, and in his speech, he thanked everyone in the crew, like everyone. Right. And he, and he, I was like, man, what a great, cool guy, you know. Um, uh, I, and 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 that rubbed off on a lot of us too. Right. Um, not Will so much, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> uh, no, it was great. There was it was a it was uh, it was a treat. It was a very special that we we were uh, lucky enough to know it was special. It's not like looking back on it, going, "Gosh, I wish I," yeah. you know, it was, those were special times. We knew it, and it was a, a privilege and uh, exciting to be on. Right. You know. We were talking about legal permissions earlier. Is there anything at all you're allowed to say at this stage about the reunion? And allow me to just live tweet this as you say it. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, we oh, got to boot this up. Hold on. Yeah, yeah. We had the reunion last night. Uh. Um, <laughs> uh, Kanye already tweeted right, right. about it. So <laughs> it's a little late on that. That's what Donda really was. It was. Well, the <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry to, 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 you know, be the bearer of frustrating news, but I know as much, literally as much as you do, and I get my information pretty much from where everybody gets their information, which is the internet. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk, talk to each other and email or call each other and verify it, but um, I mean, that's how Mitch found out about the Netflix thing. Right. Uh, on really? The internet. Yeah. Wow. On Deadline Hollywood or whatever it is. Seriously. And then uh, it's a, a, <laughs> an odd way to do business. I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> would be my first choice, but yeah. Um, do you, I mean, do you think that the, I mean, it sounds like the, the TV component of it, meaning the, ep the, the episodes that would lead up to the movie are, are kind of falling into place. Do you have a gut feeling of if the movie itself is also a likelihood? Well, I suppose, I, I, I suppose the, the idea that uh, Mitch had to do these 10 or uh, nine episodes, however many cast members there are, uh, um, uh, where it concentrates on each cast member, but there's, uh, you know, it's interwoven with other people coming in and out of each other's things, and it's basically to get everybody up to speed and what, what's been going on the last five years and to explain, you know, why uh, Michael and Alia look the way they do now, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, is, is all to get the family, the unit back together, uh, uh, most likely in L.A., to 
to do the thing that will become the movie, which I can't talk about. Right. Uh, um, but it is a genius idea. I can't, it's so good. <laughs> it's really, it's really, yeah. Mitch has told me, uh, like what he knows so far, I'm sure right. it'll change a little bit, but uh, man, great, great, awesome idea. Cannot, awesome. cannot wait. One of the most prominent things, and, and really the reason that we get to have you here tonight. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, um, I guess, <laughs> it's tough to answer that. Um, Right. That would be your, yeah. your IFC series, uh, The Increasingly Poor Decisions of, of Todd Margaret. So this is a show that you created with, uh, with Sean Pye, who's a, a British uh, comedian, writer. Some people might know him from uh, the HBO series Extras. How, can you talk about how that collaboration uh, be, you know, came to be? Can Americans and British people talk to each other? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, uh, a man called Alexander Graham Bell <laughs> invented a, something called a telephone. And uh, no, uh, it was, uh, again, like I was saying before, this was not my idea. The, the Todd, Todd Margaret is my idea, but the idea to do this show was not mine. Uh, I was in London doing stand up. Uh, um, I'm quite popular. <laughs> um, and. Uh, uh, I was doing stand-up there, and uh, one of the nights, uh, these two women, um, not necessarily my audience, uh, uh, came up to me. Um, they were from RDF Media, never heard of it. Uh, and they said, give me a card. Uh, would I be interested in creating a show uh, for the UK uh, to be specifically created with, uh, co-written with a, a British writer? Um, produced in the UK for the UK with the uh, hope, the intention to also sell it to back to the United States as well. Um, and uh, uh, initially it was like, seriously, it was after a show and you know, yeah. they're real fun if you do stand up and uh, um, just shots and yeah, whatever, drinking and, <laughs> and I took the card. I didn't even think about it for like two days and then I found the card and I was like, oh yeah, that lady with the show thing. And um, uh, I gave her a call and, and basically uh, we set it up. The, the, we immediately knew that we uh, didn't want it to be fish out of water, kind of just simply, you know, well, in America, what, you drive on the wrong side of the street? You know, everybody, it's 2000 and well, back then it was whatever it was. Um, and, you know, everybody knows Brits and Brits know us. And, uh, um, and I cannot do a, a convincing English accent. So I knew, knew I had to be an American. Um, and that's where I came up with the idea uh, that Todd Margaret became. And I also pitched it uh, because they, the British model of doing television is six series and then you're done. And it's not, not you don't have to wait necessarily a year, but you do right. six, you write six, you shoot six, you edit them, they air. You do six more if they say, yeah, go ahead and do six more. And right. you know, it's not the same deal. And um, and that was very enticing, and, and uh, what I found intriguing about that was like, oh, I can actually tell a story right. that's not open-ended. It's not gonna be Friends or, or 30 Rock or something like that. It's like- Work I can, it. Yeah, or work <laughs> it. Um, uh, There's something about this character in particular, though, who, you know, he tells preposterous lies. He's always on the, sort of the verge of getting caught and then has to tell even more outrageous lies to propel himself and you know keep himself out of trouble that you know it seems to suit you or that you seem to really <laughs> <laughs> you really seem to get into that kind of a character and i wonder what it would i'm not i'm not accusing you of being a liar but what is it about that my whole life is a <laughs> lie what am i even doing here i wasn't in mr show <laughs> um uh well, I, I, I hadn't thought of that or, or made that observation. Uh, um, it, it, it really, I mean, you know, the, the, the story dictated the character. It was really this, the story that was first and then finding a character to, to the protagonist that could drive everything and why, how would, it, it was really a device, really, uh, a way to tell the story. Um, right. And I, I don't think Todd is a, and he's been described like this, uh, I don't think he's a pathological liar. I think he's uh, uh, an infuriating fool. Um, I, don't, I don't imagine he's, um, he's just, 
he's dumb, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and he, he uh, thinks, and he means well, that's the other thing, he, he usually means well, and um, he's trying, but he's just a, a fool, and he, uh, but I don't think he's a pathological liar, uh, um, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, this is all just sort of born out of, you know, he had the opportunity to maybe do something that he'd never done before. To take, that's the thing, he, yeah. that's, he, it all starts, um, the very beginning, the first 60 seconds of the show, you know, he is mistaken for, he's listening to these self-help CDs, which nobody knows, or the, the, the Will Arnett's character doesn't know. He looks like he's on the phone, and he's, he's uh, listening to these self-help CDs, which we find out in series two more about the CDs, how he comes to have them, where they're from. And, uh, uh, and then he's offered, this is a, a, just a doofy guy who's in his, you know, 40s, who doesn't have a girlfriend, has, has a shitty apartment, his parents live down the street. He's got no future, got no, he has no ambition, no drive. He's skating by, he's in a temp job still. And a guy comes in and says, how'd you like to make $150,000, go to London, head up your own office? E I, I would say, oh, yeah, okay. Even <laughs> if, I, if I was in his position, and right. I, I would think, it's logical to think that he'd say, sure, and as he says in, um, in, in the next scene, when he's, when he's breaking up with the girlfriend, right. you know, all I gotta do is sit in an office and just take some calls and that's it, probably go to expense account lunches and how tough can it be? And in his mind, it's not tough. So of course you'd lie and go, yeah, great. Oh, no, I uh, spent my summers in Leeds, right. you know, and, and <laughs> with no idea that how awful and horrific things are about to become, right. you know, and a lot of it by his own design, but some of it not among the cast members uh, is your Arrested Development co-star, uh, Will Arnett. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, did you bring him on the show, I mean, just because, you know, you know, the joy of working with him, but, you know, was it a sort of clandestine way of keeping Arrested Development going and maybe... No, yeah. I mean, he's, he's really talented. This is our, our fourth project that we've worked on together, actually. Uh, um, not, not sequentially, but uh, we've worked on a number of things together, and... Uh, um, you know, he owes me a substantial amount of money, so anytime I can employ him, I garnish the wage. And, um, uh, and he, Will was the only guy we wrote for. Uh, um, I mean, obviously, we knew I was gonna be in it, but I had approached Will, right. and so we were able to write for Will and the pilot and everything, and, uh, um, and which is a treat. And, and yeah. writing for that character, I remember telling him, um, going, God damn it, I, it's really fun, and I, I'm really happy with the script, but I'm so jealous because I want to play Wiltz. I don't want to play Todd. I want to play no. Wiltz. It would be so <laughs> much fun to play. As I said, Will was the only character we, we wrote for, um, and we knew he, he was going to be in it and had his voice. And, uh, and it's uh, the most fun character to write for that I've, of anything I've written in 20 years. It's, it's a treat, man, coming up with those awful, nasty, because somebody else is going to have to say it. And he would bum out. He would really... By the end of the day, and he would apologize to the women in the in the scenes. And when we were when we were shooting the the scene at the hotel, and he says, uh, uh, "There's a couple awful lines," and he goes, uh, "I bet your bush smells like Chinatown during a heat wave." <laughs> and, uh, I mean, he was, he, it really bummed him out, and he would, like, call his wife and just feel shitty at the end of the day and apologize, and, and, and Sean and I, when we're writing that stuff, we were, we were, like, doubling over, and we're like, oh, my God, no, no, wait, you know, and, um, and it, it's a real joy to, to write for that character, but, uh, uh, Will, I gotta say, uh, as his story becomes revealed, uh, he really, I mean, uh, episode six, in which everything comes to a head, uh, when we were editing it, we had, and we did not write it this way, had no intention, but it turns out to be really poignant towards the end, like in a way that we were all like, wow. You know, and Johnny Marr scored it, and he does an amazing job, and, and, and when you see what happens with Will's character and, uh, and, and Todd, and it, there's a, there's a, it's, I was blown away by, and we were like, well, let's go in this direction. It's, it's really good, but we had no intention. Never, didn't write it, didn't think it was gonna be like that, but Will really um, does some 
really excellent, excellent acting in this, this series. And you'll see because he has a, a, a bigger range because of what happens with his character. And among the other cast members, uh, you know, Spike Jones had, uh, you know, he was in a couple of episodes in the first season and he has an even more substantial presence, it looks like, in the, in the new mm -hmm. season. You know, he's somebody that so rarely, you know, seems to take acting roles at all. I mean, is there at all a backstory in terms of how he was brought into this or he just sort of responded to it? Great, crazy, crazy happenstance. Uh, and it's the weirdest, it sounds like I'm making it up. They, uh, as you, as you uh, pointed out, the, his character, Doug Whitney, was um, supposed to be only in the pilot. And then we had him, uh, uh, we had an opportunity to have him in the, in the first series and then even more so in the second series. And um, so knowing that he was just in the pilot, uh, before IFC was involved, uh, uh, Channel 4 in the UK were like, hey, you know, you might get extra money for the budget if you can get a, one of your, a cameo from one of your celebrity friends. And uh, so I had a little list like of, of people I knew that I thought would be good for Doug Whitney. Right. Um, uh, you know, just uh, various actors and comedians and, and people that would be, that would give it some punch, you know, for, for those guys. And, uh, and, and I, pu I put that list away and I didn't really think about it. This is, uh, you know, it was gonna be a while before we went to cast it. And then I was, uh, a couple days later, I was like, hey, wait a minute. What about Spike? Spike would be great. I wonder. And it just occurred to me. It was a very odd, random thing to be walking down the street and think of Spike. I had happened to come back. I was going back and forth to London, uh, New York at the time. I happened to be back in New York. It was a couple weeks later. And I have a house upstate. And it's in a teeny, tiny, minuscule, teeny, tiny, tiny town. And I drove to this other tiny town. Uh, literally one little main street with like seven stores on it, and uh, and I <laughs> and I'm there, and I, I can't remember why I was there, but uh, there's a guy on a bench outside of this little deli thing with a cup of coffee and a sandwich, wearing that like that kind of Vermont red hunter's jacket, and I, and he's he's um, like like I'm the podium, and he's this guy's eating this sandwich, and he's kind of looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and then looking away because it's weird, you know. Um, <laughs> And we're both kind of looking at each other, and uh, and after like 30 seconds of this, uh, he's like, David, <laughs> Spike, <laughs> and he was there visiting his then girlfriend who uh, had a house in the woods. I'm t when I say it's in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> it's in the middle of nowhere, and I was like, oh my god, that's crazy. I I I was just thinking about you. Uh, anyway, that, so that was a story, and I asked him, he's like, yeah, whatever you want. Right. You know? and, and up until that moment, you're just kind of eyeing each other and not... It was a good 30 seconds of awkward kind of like... Because he had the same thought, like, right. well, that guy looks like David Cross, but there's no way David Cross <laughs> would be in this tiny podunk town, right. you know, three hours outside the city in the middle of nowhere in the woods, and I had the same thing about Spike, like, why would... That can't be Spike, and a lot of people look like this, right. you know. <laughs> Uh, now that this project's over, and it, it, I was in living in London for the better part of two years working on this and just focused completely on this. And, uh, and then when I came back, I went right, literally two days later, to Running Wild, and then I went back to London. And um, I just didn't have time to work on new material, but I will, I will be starting, actually, in the, the uh, I have to go to LA tomorrow for press, but I'm planning when I get back. Uh, I have little gigs lined up at friend shows where I'll just start the process of, of a lot of unfunny stuff and getting the little nuggets and just going up and having a piece of paper. And uh, um, I will tell you one joke right now. Uh, uh, I think that the, you know, the, 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 the terrorist bombings in the 2012 London Olympics were awful. Understood. <laughs> they, were, they were terrible. They were terrible. And I'm not making light of it. But if there is a silver lining, it's that the 2016 Paralympic team that America feels should be quite strong. <laughs> I'm not done. I don't know, no, and then pause, pause, pause. Too soon? <laughs> All right. Can we have one last round of applause for the extraordinary David Cross? Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you guys.